Thank you. All right. Hi. This is my first FOSDEM, and I'm having such a good time. Can you hear me okay? Awesome. Um, I'm Larissa. Joanna just did a great job of introducing me. Um, she's right. I am a former developer and product manager. I worked on many things, but the open source projects you would know are uh, Bind, the name server software, ISC, DHCP, uh, Open Solaris, and then Mozilla Projects. Um, used to be a Perl hacker, hacked a lot of Perl long ago. So, um, other things about me which are maybe interesting. I'm a mom. I'm 45. Don't have a technical degree. I'm from California. English is my first language. I attempt Spanish and I attempt German and French, but if you come at me too fast, I won't understand you. <laughs> um, I'm pointing those things out, not so much because they're relevant to the content of the talk, but they're relevant to who I am and their elements of diversity, right? I'm also a queer woman. Uh, what else? Not, there's lots of things about me that are me that are part of who I am and they're part of what I bring to work and to my community contributions, right? And all of you have lots of things about you that are relevant to your work and to your community contributions. And the best environments for us are the ones where we can bring all those things and not have fear about that. So that is what we're going to get around to talking about. Some things we might cover. <laughs> I'm going to talk to these slides, but I'm also going faster than I would have because it's a half an hour, not an hour. I'll talk a little bit about our CPG is a quick way of writing community participation guidelines. A little bit about why we changed them, because we went through a big process of changing them. Uh, what we've learned through changing them, um, in case you might want to change yours or you might want to learn from our mistakes or you're part of our community and you're curious, any of those things. Just a side note, I love questions. There are no wrong or stupid questions with me ever. And you can ask them anytime. Just put your hand way up because there's a lot of you. Okay, so feel free to interrupt me, it's okay. So, uh, this is something that Mitchell said about why we have our community participation guidelines. I like people to read it. I'll let you read it. Basically, if our mission as Mozilla is to make the internet a global public resource open and accessible to all, we need to be a community made up of the diversity of the world and we need to be a community and a product welcoming of the diversity of the world. And to do that, we need to have ways that we work together, that we know how to work together. Okay, so I'm going to have you answer questions if you want. I have t-shirts. They look like this. They are this t-shirt. I will give you one after this out there so that we don't interrupt the next talk. If you want to answer any of these questions, and you don't have to be right, just like there's no stupid questions, there are no wrong answers. There are just different answers. Anybody? Or I can answer them. All the t-shirts will be mine. It's okay if you don't want to. I'm going to start and people can jump in. So what are the community participation guidelines? We talked about that, but basically they are Mozilla's code of conduct for how we treat each other, are the behaviors that we expect and the behaviors that we do not think are acceptable. And they are applied everywhere that Mozillians are together. Um, when did we make them? I believe it's eight years ago, the first version. And uh, what's changed about the guidelines and why, I'm going to get into in my presentation, so we don't need to worry about that. Uh, why do we need them at all? Well, we talked about that. And I would say, because in order for us to feel safe bringing our whole selves into a project, we need to know that that's not going to cause us a problem or a barrier. And also that if you're a person who is in some way substantially different than the other people already in the project, you need to know that you're specifically welcome. Not just that people are welcome, but that you are welcome. That's really important. Um, anyway, I'm going to keep going because it's okay. <laughs> uh, so I like to highlight this slide because it's sort of why we have the guidelines, right? 
we need to have a baseline shared understanding for how we treat each other and a process for what to do when that doesn't work out. If we don't have that, then we don't know what's expected of us and we don't know what to do when things go wrong, which happens more often than we would like to think. All right, um, this is a few statistics about, more about the why, um, and there's three here. The first one is based on an EU study about um, inappropriate behavior, and it's a workplace statistic, but I think in many ways open source is like a workplace in this, in this regard. So 14% of people in the EU report problematic behavior, uh, and 20% of Mozillians have reported something happening online that they found inappropriate. And that was a Mozilla staff statistic, but it also seems to be being borne out in community research. Um, and also relevant is that these kinds of situations often shift who feels safe to participate, and that may be one reason why only 11% of open source community participants are women. There are lots of other diversity demographic statistics we could go into. That's not really the theme of this talk, but I love to talk about it. If someone wants to find me at lunch tomorrow, feel free. Okay, so uh, one of the things I want to talk about is like how and why we changed our process. So we created our community participation guidelines and they were much like an event code of conduct, um, but a little more general. And they were not necessarily extremely specific about the different groups of people and communities and attributes of people that they protect or what would happen if something went wrong, right? It was more general than that. And over time, we got a lot of feedback from people, as well as I would say the entire culture around these types of documents shifted and has moved forward. And so we decided we needed to do a revision. And I tried there to map out what we did, but basically we got a lot of feedback. Then we also did um, two different substantive diversity and inclusion research projects. One um, broad, broad project with a more, more involving Mozilla staff and the second one being very specifically community focused. And in both cases, we got a lot of information that people didn't know what the guidelines were or what they were expecting them to do or how to make a report of a problem or what would happen if they did or whether the guidelines applied to or protected them. So we were like, well, this is a problem, right? So we started a revision and we did some community forums where we met with lots of folks and asked people what they needed. We um, gave a revised version, a period of comment where we put it on a lot of different um, Mozilla discourse and other forums, public blog posts, et cetera, to get feedback. Um, we got a lot of feedback. <laughs> We incorporated a lot of feedback. Um, we then revised the guidelines with a team and with Mozilla's leadership. So what we ended up with involves directly editorial work by our most senior leadership, which I think is important for any project that, you're, that your leadership team, your, your whatever that group of people is, really support and buy into whatever you come up with as guidelines, because otherwise when things go sideways, they may not feel strong about backing you and you really want that. Um, and then we re-released the guidelines and I'll go over the content of them in a second. But um, we also very much consider them a living document and that people can recommend changes or effectively make a pull request and submit a patch, right, anytime. And um, in fact, there's one place in here where I have italicized something because it's something that we're reintegrating, that we're integrating in right now based on someone's uh, contribution. So, what's in the guidelines anyway? Does anyone have any questions yet? All right, I'm gonna talk about what's in there and then a little bit about what you might wanna do if you have your own guidelines or you're trying to make them. I'm gonna go quickly, there's a lot of stuff here, but also um, I put the slides on the FOSDEM page and I'll send them to anyone who needs them. This is the first two paragraphs of the guidelines. I like to share them separate from talking about the more sort of bulleted list sections because I think they get into the spirit of why we have it and what it really means. Um, we really want to recognize, appreciate, and respect the diversity of our global contributors. 
everyone who engages with Mozilla in any way and all of the different things that we are, right? And we expect agreement and adherence to the guidelines from everyone who's involved, right? So that we can have a safe and positive experience. And that is important enough to emphasize many times and I would encourage those of you who organize Mozilla stuff to make this that clear to your communities. I find it has nothing but a positive benefit when we do. Um, there's lots of words here, but the high level, the TLDR of this is that any place that you are representing Mozilla or in a Mozilla space or engaging with Mozillians or doing a thing that you have Mozilla attached to you, you are covered by the guidelines and so are the other people there. So like one of the things people don't always think about is if you're at a conference that's not a Mozilla conference, but you're representing Mozilla, and something happens to you that's really not awesome and you feel violates the guidelines, but the other person is not necessarily a Mozillian, we will still try to help you and we will talk to the conference and do our best to advocate with you because you are there as a Mozillian, right? For example. Basically, if you're not sure whether a situation is covered by the guidelines, it probably is. Um, this is a long list of diversity dimensions, and then you'll notice the nice Firefox orange, any other dimensions not listed comment. That means if it turns out that in your community there's a huge war between the people that wear the blue socks and the people that wear the orange socks, and someone insults someone else based on their sock choices, it's still in the guidelines, right? We just don't take our commentary to personal attributes. We don't. And, um, also, there's a lot of things here that are specifically described in English that may not be described in the same way in your native language and maybe aren't clear. And that's what I mean when I say there's no stupid questions. If you want to ask me later, like, what does that mean? I don't understand. It's really okay. I'm happy to talk about it, whatever it is. And I mean that. Sometimes people don't think I mean it. Um, there you go. And sometimes there are also dimensions of diversity that are really important in a specific cultural context that aren't listed because either we were unaware of them or they're really important to a small group of people as opposed to the broader global community. They're still, they're still covered. Okay. Um, there we go. So these are like the, the titles of four long paragraphs in the actual text of the guidelines, which is on mozilla.org, and there's a link to it in the slides, but also if you just use your favorite search engine, DuckDuckGo community participation guidelines, you will find them. Um, the four things that we really expect from Mozillians, and which I believe are really important in general for all of us, are to be respectful. Um, hopefully I don't need to explain what that means. Being direct but professional, and professional is a little bit of a funky word in the context of volunteerism, but I would say um, what we mean there is it's really okay to have conflicts, it's really okay to disagree, but we need to do it in a way where we really let the other person know, but in a respectful manner, right? And then listen to them and have even a heated argument, just without devolving into personal attacks. Um, Appreciating and accommodating similarities and differences. I think the really important thing here is accommodating and like within Mozilla, one of the things that comes up a lot here is thinking about other people's language or time zone or food. It was too dark. Thanks. Yeah, it's getting dark outside. And I'm really jet lagged, so if I don't notice like, you know, meteors coming at us, that's because I'm I'm from California. Ah, oh, it was just like nothing. All right, thanks for that. So, um, and there's more detailed examples on the, and again in the full version, but also I think leading by example is really important. We're all, anybody who's here is probably involved enough in your communities that you are in fact a leader. So the ways that we act and the ways that we treat people, other people notice and do the same. It's really important um, to me, and I think to many of us. All right. Uh, this is the fun slide about the things that we don't do. So um, I think what's important 
to me to point out here is a lot of this is relatively obvious, but um, one thing is that the impact of violent language that is just, and I'm using what Americans call air quotes there, in words on a screen is big. And it sometimes might seem like that's not a big impact, but one of the things that studies show is that violent words lead to violent behavior, right? So um, we don't tolerate violent words. We don't tolerate people talking about killing each other, people talking about guns. No. Um, another thing that's maybe not always obvious is influencing or instigating unacceptable behavior. So like heckling a speech is not okay. Neither is elbowing your neighbor and being like, heckle this person, yell at that guy, right? That's not okay. Um, the thing that's in, ta in italics, that's because that's a recent submission that I'm adding in to the guidelines, which is that it's not okay to be at an event and see someone say something totally racist or sexist or homophobic to someone else and not deal with it. That doesn't mean you need to like interrupt and make a giant scene. You need to find a way to deal with it, right? And that's hard. That's a big expectation, right? But I think it's important that as, as community, we stand together and take care of each other. So that's why we're making that evolution of our guidelines. Well, this is a big, long slide, and I'm not going to go into detail here, but what I want to say is if you are a person who's creating your own guidelines or code of conduct, it's really important to spell out really clearly for people what will happen if they make a report or if someone makes a report, what potential sorts of consequences there are, who will hear about it, because that makes people both feel more safe reporting and feel hopefully less worried that there's going to be some random thing that's going to come after them, right? Um, if people don't know who's at the other end of the thing, right, they have something really painful that they need to tell someone and they're sending it to an anonymous email alias and they don't know who's on the other end, they may not do it, right? So we try to be really explicit. You will reach these people. These are the things that could happen. When people respond to us, we have a whole process that we go through um, and you'll hear like, I will get back to you in this many days. I will not tell anybody else about this until you tell me it's okay, those kinds of things. Really, I, I have found this to be important. And in general, I would say if you're the person who's created a code of conduct or a, or a guidelines for your organization, one of the number one things, and I'll get to this more, is just be prepared for people to actually use them. That's <laughs> like really a big deal. Things we've learned. We learned a lot. We're a little tired. So the first thing I noticed, when we revised the guidelines, we just started talking about them more, talking about them a lot more, going to lots of meetings and talking about them. Um, and we started getting a lot more reports. And I'll admit it. At first, I was like, oh my gosh, something's going on. Suddenly, there's all this problematic behavior. So I went and talked to people who know a lot about this kind of thing. You know who knows a lot about this kind of thing? Human resources departments because they deal with it at work, right? And they said, oh no, that doesn't mean there's more problematic behavior. It means people are telling you about the behavior that was already there. So then I started hearing other things. I started hearing, I feel so much safer. Thank you for making it really clear that it's not okay for people to bug me about why I'm not drinking, right? Thank you for making it really clear that it's not okay for people to walk up to me and touch my hair, right? Thank you for being really clear that it's not okay to comment on my religion. It's not okay to make snarky comments about my not doing work on the Sabbath, whatever it is. Um, because it's not okay. And it was going on all along. And once you start talking about it, things start changing. But they start changing in a lot of ways. Um, there's a lot of value in the positive reinforcement. There's a lot of surprises. Um, here was a really unexpected story that I heard. Um, I got this email and it was from some people who had gone to JavaScript Brazil. And at JavaScript Brazil, something had gone down that they felt like was really not awesome. And they were like, we really want to write this letter of support to this woman who got up on stage at JavaScript Brazil and talked about gender and tech and had this really negative experience. And we want to know if we can say in it that, this, that we got this idea from your guidelines. And I was like, yes, please go for it, JavaScript people of Brazil. I don't know these people, I've never met them. It's just the power of the internet doing something really awesome. It's gonna happen, it happened to me, it could happen to you. Um, 
So I would say the biggest thing that we've learned is that enforcement is hard but not impossible. If you build these policies, you have to expect that people will use them. You need to practice responding. We literally came up with scenarios and talked about them, and we're still doing this. I think not everyone has gotten to do it yet, but it's like, all right, you're at a conference and somebody comes to you. Yeah, question? Time. It's been half an hour. Thank you for that. Um, I'll wrap up. I'm almost done. So I want to take questions. Um, Oh, this is a plug. We only have the CPG in five languages. Those are the five languages. If you speak another language and you'd like to help us localize it, we want you. Uh, this is advice for people who have guidelines. I'm just going to zip along, and you can read this or ask me. Um, that's a quote from a Mozilla person about how when they don't have resources to solve conflicts, they just don't solve them and they go underground. That's not what you want. We're done. That's how you reach me. I'm happy to talk about any of your own code of conduct issues or DNI questions, and I'll be here all weekend. And tomorrow I have like no formal plans, so just send me a message. All right? That's it. Thank you.